this is the first title of this current series of talks in which an Indian word has been used, Brahmacharya. <laughs> I don't know if you understand what Brahmacharya means. No, so I don't know why they put that in the title in the first place. <laughs> the word Brahmacharya comes from the combination of the word Brahm and Acharya. Brahm is the highest god known to the yogis, the creator of the universe. And Acharya is a student, a teacher, a practitioner of an art that leads to the highest god. Therefore, Brahmacharya is the art of reaching Brahm, the lord of the three universes. It is frequently mentioned by the yogis who practice self-realization and reach the level of the Brahm, the creator, the originator of the Om, the originator of the current sound current that sustains the three universes. And the Acharyas, the practitioners of this science are also referred to as Brahmacharyas. Now, this was the original meaning of the word Brahmacharya, but as various practices for attaining Brahmahood or the level of the Brahma developed in India, slight additional meanings were given to the word Brahmacharya. For instance, it began to be used in relation to the practices for attaining Brahma and not merely for the actual attainment of the Brahma state. The methodology was also described as Brahmacharya. As time went on, the word Brahmacharya was relegated to a part of the exercises in order to reach the level of the Brahma. Now the part of life which is supposed to be devoted to practice of God realization or Brahma realization that is referred to as the Brahmacharya is the part of youth and it is said that when one is youthful that is the time when one ought to practice Brahmacharya. It's a very subtle philosophy of Brahmacharya. At a certain age in life that we are beset with the problem of having to deal with a, with a subject, say, like sex. As a very small child, one is not really bothered about it. And I guess in very old age, one is not bothered much about it. There seems to be a period of life when this subject of sex seems to bother people. And certainly a major part of the youthful life of a person is beset with the problem of how to handle sex. The problem has been further complicated by society leaders, the leaders of social groups, the, the leaders of society as we know it today, who laid down moral standards in which besides other actions of men, actions related to sex were specifically jacketed. For instance, in the institution of marriage. In most countries, the institution of marriage had a very great relevance to the question of sex. If you were married, then the husband and wife were forbidden from having any sexual relationship with anyone except the partner. And these moral codes and social codes began to have a much deeper effect upon the youthful disciple of Brahmacharya than they would have if these social codes were not there. In some countries and in some so social groups, they allow more than one wife. In some places, they allow polyandry, they can have more than one husband. At different times in the same country, we have had different social norms. In our own Indian society, at the time when the great epic of Mahabharata was written, it is said that Draupadi, a very holy woman who got all protection from Lord Krishna, had five husbands. And that was the accepted norm of that time. In India today, in several states, in several tribal areas, women still have several husbands, besides a few lovers who are also attached to them and this is part of their social order. In some societies in India, the men have several wives. In the Muslim societies, in Islam, 
A man can legitimately have four wives. Before 1955, in India, a man could have as many wives as he chose. Now he's limited to one under the new Hindu law, which has been passed by government. So these different moral norms laid down by social leaders have had a lot to do with the disciplines which a disciple of Brahmacharya had to practice. Therefore, the yogis who taught people the art of going to higher levels of consciousness, who taught people how to reach the higher awareness of the Brahma stage, they prescribed certain norms. And they said, in the youthful state, you must be very careful about how you handle sex, because it is one of the great moving spirits in man. It can be one of the greatest distractors from the spiritual path. It can be a great push on toward the spiritual path. So depending on how you handle it, it will make a lot of difference to your spiritual growth. Whether we say it or not, the fact is it is a big problem for all societies. All individuals in all societies have had to face this problem. It is one of the oldest problems which has beset mysticism and the spiritual path. So many disciplines have been evolved by mystics to take care of it. At one time it was thought that out of all the desires of man, the sexual desire is the one that draws him down the most. That out of the various passions, out of the five passions which distracts a man, this is the passion that leads him down. The other passions are also quite powerful and great distractors, like the passion of anger. The anger spreads the attention wide and scatters it. It becomes very difficult to concentrate. The passion of sex and lust lowers the attention and it is very difficult to pick it up. All passions have had their distracting influence on man. But this is one passion which has created big problems. Now the social leaders and moral leaders of society were quite content with laying down the rules and regulations of how to go about your sexual business. They laid down the rules about matrimony, but they did not realize that most people did not follow the rules. They did not realize that by laying down very rigid rules, they made most people hypocrites in society. They did not realize that by laying down such rigid rules, they made people guilty and have great guilty consciences because they felt they were doing something that was wrong because the social and moral leaders had so decreed that it was wrong. So the larger the number of rules and regulations that came up to govern this subject, the greater the problems for the spiritual seekers, the brahmacharyas, those who wanted to reach the level of the Brahma. Eventually, many yogis started trying different prescriptions of what should be done to overcome this major distraction on the spiritual path. Some said the best thing is to get rid of it. Just forget about it. We've had enough of it. Let's leave it. Once we are on the spiritual path, nothing to do with sex. No sexual relationship with anyone. We just be content with ourselves and sublimate our energies and passions into meditation. And they tried that. Many of them physically ran away. The men away from the women and some few women who were interested in this path from the men. Many of them sat on the top of the Himalayas, where no woman dare come near them. Many went into the frightening jungles of India, where the big beasts would scare anybody going there. And they began to do meditation there, free from the distraction of sex. It was not long before they discovered that by running away from women, you don't run away from sex. It did not take them long to discover that by running away from women, you do not even run away from women or the thoughts of women. They discovered that the more you run away from a thing, the more your thoughts go there. That running away from a distraction is no way of overcoming a distraction. They discovered that you cannot possibly curb a passion. If you try to curb a passion and press it down, it's like putting a snake in a basket and keeping the basket shut. You think you are safe from the snake 
But the moment the lid opens, the snake is just the same and bites you just the same. Therefore, suppression has never been found as an adequate answer to the problem of sex. There was then another school that went to the other extreme. They said the best thing is to fulfill your desire for sex. Let go. Don't think there is any harm in it. Remember, these are all man-made regulations. Therefore, don't worry. Just have free sex. Have it to its limit. Go beyond it. Satiate yourself. Get bored with it. Get fed up. So you will never think of it. There is a school of yogis today who believe in the theory that the only way to overcome sex and perhaps some other passions is to have them to satiation and beyond, to boredom, to disgust, and so get over them. But even these yogis found that excessive indulgence in a passion like sex never took them out of sex. They remained in the sexual world and could not come out of it. Therefore, the dilemma persisted that if you reject it, then also you get caught up in it. If you overindulge in it, then also you get caught up in it. Then what do we do about it? And this is where the Brahmacharya school prescribed very strict norms in order to find that common land, that compromise ground where you will neither reject it nor will you overindulge in it. Today, the prescription given by those yogis who transcended the Brahma and went beyond, who are called the perfect masters, the great mystics, their prescription is you cannot get away from it, but you cannot overindulge in it. They have said, treat it as a normal activity of the body. Don't get absorbed in it. Don't let your attention be held by it. They have said, if you avoid a thing excessively, your attention goes into it. If you indulge in a thing excessively, your attention goes into it. Do neither. Neither avoid nor overindulge. Find your own via media. Find the compromise position where your attention does not get blocked. They told us that the real secret is not in avoiding or indulging. The real secret is, is your attention held there or not? Well, they told us many other things to help us to find the via media. They said there are possibilities of gratification of the spirit at higher levels of consciousness, which automatically take you away from these lower pleasures and passions that the true answer to the problem of the distraction of sex is to be found by a journey within the self to the higher astral regions where the joy and pleasure of being in the astral region and leading an astral life is such that it automatically makes it unnecessary for you to indulge in any lower pleasures. Therefore, instead of first trying to solve this problem and then going up, which won't happen, you go up first and then solve the problem. But that's like a vicious circle. Where do we break it? Because if you don't solve the problem, you don't go up. And if you don't go up, you don't solve the problem. How do you solve this vicious circle? It is solved by attacking the problem wherever you are. Progressively going within and progressively leaving it out. The truth is that those who have achieved higher level of consciousness are automatically not interested in the distraction of sex. They are neither distracted nor attracted. They take it like a biological phenomenon. And it is of no consequence to them. But till you reach that stage, it is of great consequence. Therefore, the shift from the stage when this is a big problem to the stage when it is no problem is achieved by a progressive switching of attention from this distraction to the higher attraction within. The practitioners of the higher yoga have said that there are pleasures and joys within which are far more attractive than all the pleasures of the world put together. When I was young and used to talk to my master, I used to tell him, Master, the way you are putting it, that there are great pleasures inside and you will leave all these pleasures, they will look insipid. He used to use the word these pleasures, including the pleasure of sex, will look insipid when you have the inner pleasures. 
I used to say, Nasta, you are almost bribing people. You're giving them a big bait to come for pleasure. I thought we, we went into higher consciousness to have higher knowledge and awareness. But you are attracting people by pleasure. You are saying it's very enjoyable inside in the higher regions. And the master would say, do you realize the human mind does not go anywhere except on pleasure? If I don't make the spiritual path pleasurable, nobody will come. If it's completely dry, people will try for a while and then go over to something else. The human mind is only attracted by pleasure. There is no other way to draw it. We have tried it. Nobody will do, go and do meditation for the sake of getting knowledge of God. Nobody will go within and discover his reality for the sake of the higher enlightenment. Those people don't exist. People are interested in going to higher regions for the great joy and pleasure it gives them. The mind turns to pleasure. Even here, the master said, if you look in this world, what is the pleasure that draws you? The one that is better than the previous one. The mind is not used to a single pleasure. It will leave one pleasure the moment you offer it a better one. In fact, this is the way to handle the mind. You can handle the mind not by suppressing it, but by offering it greater pleasure. That is why in the astral world, the very first world which you realize through meditation, you get a pleasure unknown to this world. And that is the answer to the problem of distractions of all pleasures of this world. So the real answer to this problem of brahmacharya is that you maintain such moderate life that you have enough abstinence not to be overindulging and you have enough of it not to be completely absorbed in the thought that you are denying it to yourself. If you can find this balance, you have found a little place to break the vicious circle which holds you down. There are of course many smaller prescriptions on the physical plane itself. Like you must have lot of exercise bodily to take your mind off. Lot of spiritual and yogic exercises we are prescribed for that purpose. At a certain period in the history of Indian yoga, some yogis prescribed yogic exercises and postures which enhanced the sexual desire and the sexual power. At that time, the belief was that this was the way out. And certain tantric yogic practices came into being in which sex had to be employed as an instrument of realization. And that was based upon the theory that you have to get rid of a desire before you can become desireless. And there are only two ways of getting rid of a desire, either to fulfill it or to sublimate it by fulfilling another desire which is higher than that. Several temples exist in India today which show the erotic state in which the yogis practice their yoga just because of this belief. And at that time, the yogic postures were evolved. For this purpose. Today, of course, in the yoga books I see here selling in the market, they're all mixed up. Nobody has even discriminated between one yogic exercise and another. They haven't even said what it means. They're quite confused as to which posture is good. For what? To help you regulate the sexual life to the moderate one in which it is required for the purpose of getting away from the vicious circle. You have to undertake those yogic exercises and those physical exercises which take you off from the idea and attention of sex. Many exercises are strenuous and are useful. One can always, of course, go into details. I am not today going into the details of the various asanas or the various yogic exercises which take care of this. I am only referring to them that in Indian yoga, you have a set of exercises which takes you off from this and set of exercises which makes you come back to it. So it enables you to choose the right place. The mystics of the higher order above the yog yogis have of course said that even your life should be designed to provide you with a moderate indulgence. And therefore they have recommended that the best life for a good disciple is a life of a householder. The words used in the texts are the life of a householder, by which it is meant 
that a man should marry, rear, bring up children, and live a normal life. He should neither avoid nor overindulge. So they have said that even in society, you can design your life in such a way that you are enabled to take care of this problem of distraction. But since I have, I have mentioned to you that all possibilities are there, all schools of thought are available, therefore one can be confused unless one knows which school of yoga one is following. And I have said in India, all these three schools of thought have prevailed and even now today prevail. And many practices are going on on each of these schools of abstinence, of overindulgence and of regulated householder's life. Brahmacharya certainly has a big effect on awareness. Even in ordinary life, when we are trying to do our ordinary worldly work with the normal level of awareness, we find that these two passions, the passion of anger and the passion of sex, are the most deleterious to our power of concentration. These are the two which need the maximum control and regulation. In the science of Brahmacharya, they have said that in the youthful age, when from adolescence onwards till your late 40s or 50s, during that age, you must control these two passions, your anger and your lust. If you don't control them, one will scatter your attention, the other will lower your attention and you will be unfit to do meditation. Your meditation will not be successful. You will see nothing when you close your eyes. Your thoughts will go away. It will become difficult even to repeat any holy names or do any simran and you will be left dry and disappointed. Therefore, it is best wherever you can to overcome these two passions. In the practice of brahmacharya, they teach you how not to lose temper and how not to lose your power over your own sexual life. These two are principal methods which they follow in the practice of brahmacharya today. Some people who have been practicing this say that there can be a time when we find that these practices themselves keep us away from higher awareness. That is true. If you do these practices mechanically on your own, you won't succeed. People are reading books and trying to do it. Even for the lowest yogic results of astral realization, of Brahm realization, you cannot possibly do it on your own. There is no way of controlling your temper and controlling your passion or lust on your own. I'd still like to meet a guy who has done it. I haven't come across a person. I came across a man. I've come across claimants for this. I came across a person whose disciple said that he never loses his temper. I said then he must have crossed a particular region on the spiritual journey where these five passions walk away. And they say bye-bye walking away like children. That, this, that visual experience takes place when you really get over these passions. When you switch from this vicious circle onto the path beyond these, you actually get a visual experience of these passions leaving you. So they leave you no doubt. They say you have now transcended our region, so we are going. And the, interestingly, the different people who have had that experience have all seen the same kind of vision of these passions taking the form of little children going away and waving goodbye to you. So I said to those disciples that this gentleman who has overcome loss of temper must have done so. Then he must have seen those kids going away. They said he never spoke about the kids going away, but he says he doesn't lose temper. So I spent about 15 minutes with that gentleman and he was so mad at me. He was so <laughs> mad at the things I was saying. Of course, I was not saying very nice things, but the object was not to say nice things. The object was to say that even if you haven't lost temper for years, the kids haven't left you. They are still there. You can by willpower hold the anger and temper within yourself. That doesn't mean you have lost temper. Sometimes in the practice of controlling your temper, you try and hold it within and put up an appearance, but it is still biting you from inside. It is still hurting you from inside. You haven't controlled your temper. It is still there. 
That is not the way they suggest that you control your temper. The yogic manner, the brahmacharya system of controlling your temper is to rise above the causes of temper. What makes us mad? What makes us mad is our inability to communicate. Have you ever thought of it? That it is the inability to communicate that makes us mad. If we could communicate, we would never be mad. I sometimes sound very simple, but you should think over what I am saying. You'll find it is truth that the inability to communicate is the reason for our losing our temper. When we do not know what the other guy is saying or thinking, it's then that we get mad. When we cannot be at the same level of understanding, we are mad. Now, how does that happen? What is coming in the way of communication? Some people used to think and they still think that if you know more words, you can communicate better. This morning, I was having a discussion with some friends and I was telling them that in fact, my experience shows that if you know more words, you communicate less. That if you speak less, you communicate more. That the knowledge of more words from the dictionary does not help communication. That words have meanings which are quite different for everybody. How do we communicate? With words. And what are these words? They are nothing but phonetic symbols. Just sounds having a meaning in the mind, in consciousness, based upon the earlier association of ideas of those sounds. That is all. There is nothing else in a word. A word has a meaning depending upon the context, the association, the experience in which we have seen or heard it earlier. It has no other meaning. Therefore, every word we use has a meaning for us based upon our own community, our own association of ideas with that word in earlier life. Now, since no two persons have had the same life, no two persons can have the same meaning to a word. No two persons ever use any word with the same meaning. It is not possible. You can't do it. Because no two persons can completely substitute their lives for the same life. Even if there's a shade difference in the two lives, the meaning of words is different for the two people. When I use a word, it means what I know, what it means to me. And there is no way of communicating that meaning to anyone else. Because the meaning has arisen out of my experience in the use of that word earlier, which is different from the experience of everybody else. When we try and communicate in such words, and that's the only communication we know, we never understand each other. We don't know what we are saying to each other. The more we say, the less we know. You must have seen people having very good relations. They say, I love you and all that sort of thing out here in this country. And it lasts till they speak more. And they speak more, they misunderstand. Then they fight. Then they break up. People who sit in parks and hold hands and are very lovey-dovey, they haven't spoken a word, they don't get a chance to speak. After they get married and have all the time, they divorce. Because they speak out. And they misunderstand. How can there be communication with words which don't have the same meaning? And how can we evolve a language which can have the same meaning? Is there any language? So long as we are using the human mind for communication, there can be no language which can communicate. The human mind must divide, analyze, break. That's the job of the mind. To understand everything by breaking it apart. If the human mind breaks apart, how will it join? How will it create togetherness? It never has. I like you to go and find out if any man, by the use of his mind and intellect, has ever found togetherness, ever created togetherness. Nine times out of ten, this excessive use of the human mind has broken togetherness where it was there. It has not even in one case brought people together. Something else brings them together. That is not the human mind and those are not words. And even when they are brought together with something that is not the human mind and not words, this mind and words break them away. This mind then which breaks is the source of all passion, is the source of temper, is the source of doubt. We don't know what the other person is saying. Therefore, we are doubtful. Therefore, we suspect. Therefore, we break away. When we get together and have the feeling of togetherness, it arises from the human soul, which alone is capable of loving. Love is not an attribute of the human mind at all. No mind ever existed of anybody which could experience love. 
No mind has ever had the experience of love. The mind has not even been able to understand what love is. It has tried to. The mind has debated on what is love. The mind has discussed love. The mind has used words to talk about love. The mind has never understood what is love. Therefore, the, the love that joins people together, which comes from the human soul, is something quite apart from the mental intellectual activities that we indulge in. It is the love that brings us together. It is the mind that separates and breaks us. Loss of temper is because of lack of communication. It is the passion which has to be avoided by a brahmacharya. A brahmacharya cannot attain higher states of consciousness unless he controls this passion too. Therefore, what should he do? I have told you the prescription about the lower passion of the sex which brings the attention down. The yogis give the prescription for the higher passion of anger, which is equally important for a brahmacharya. And they say, don't rely on the mind. They use many words, still the mind, control the mind, do something to the mind, so that you are not caught in the mind's plan. Do not let the mind interfere with your natural capabilities, natural faculties bestowed upon you by the Lord Almighty, the Creator, the faculties of love and intuition and beauty and joy given to you by virtue of your having a soul. When the soul is there, these faculties are there with us naturally. These are the real faculties of ourself. Let these not be destroyed by an overuse of the mind. It is very difficult to control the mind. In Indian history of yoga, we have umpteen examples of yogis having reached high astral states and having fallen from there only because of the mind and because of these two passions, anger and sex. Any number of stories, and they are told and repeated for our benefit. We have sages who are sitting in, in jungles for thousands of years, they extended their lives and had been successful in their meditation. And one woman like Menaka goes and lures a sage of that order and he falls from that pedestal. Thereafter, in order to protect what he has done, he loses his temper, performs miracles as a result of his temper, loses all that he got. These stories are told to us. Gives birth to a woman called Shakuntala and we have a whole play going on showing the story of that great sage, what happened to him because of these two passions. In the practice of Brahmacharya, these are the two important things and they both arise from the mind. Therefore, we come back to the question, how can we control our mind? What is the way to control our mind? Now, here you must consider that there is no way for the mind to control itself. Anybody who says, my mind has found the answer to this problem is in a delusion because he is being led up the garden path by the very enemy you are trying to beat. The very mind you want to control is telling you, I have found the way. He will keep you away from the way all the time. Then where shall we get the lessons from if we don't listen to our mind? Here, the prescription is, if you want to practice brahmacharya and go to higher realms, you must have a guru, you must have a teacher, you must have somebody else than the mind to guide you. And you must not accept his guidance through the mind, accept it directly without your mind. You must not take his guidance with your understanding, take it with his understanding. Don't read his instructions with your mind, read instructions without your mind. If you don't do that, it's no use having a teacher or a spiritual guide. Who can be our guide in this world? Let's examine who can help us to solve the problem of the mind and therefore the problem of temper and passion and so on, which I have been talking about. Who can help us? The trees and the forests and the mountains and the nature. People look to nature for help. Well, nature is beautiful. Fine. Have a look at it. Very artistic. Draw it in. Where does it go, all that experience into your mind? How does it resolve the problem of the mind? Well, you say, I am a great seeker. I can get instruction from anywhere. It's all God's handiwork. Even in a tree, I see God. Even the tree inspires me towards God. That is precisely how the mind functions. It's the mind that makes you, makes the tree speak to you. The words the tree is speaking to you are the words of your own mind. 
There is no other speech of a tree except the words of your own mind. It may be a tree, birds, animals. Whatever instruction they give you is what your own mind is giving. Books. Do you know when you read a book, it means what your mind accepts? And the book means different things to you at different times? If the instruction in the book were the same, how could it mean different things at different times? How could you say every time I read a book, it means more to me? How could you say, I never understood this when I first read the book, I understand it today. The book is the same. It's your mind. Your mind is accepting only as much from the book as it already knows, as it wants to know, as it allows you to know. Ideas, world of ideas, they are your mind. Spirits, ghosts, the spirits of the great masters who have gone away, who come in visions to us, in dreams, can they guide us? No, they are the mind. They are all mental projections. However, vivid the vision may be, it is a mental projection. And if they speak to you, it is the mind speaking to you. Then how do you get out of this problem of the mind? Yeah, another human being with his own mind is not your mind. That is obvious. If there is anything in this whole wide world where you can be certain this is not your mind, it is another human being with his mind and not your mind. But then he is a human being like you. Why should you accept him? In what way is he better than you? What is the proof? How do you know anything about him? You are a human being. You are evolved to the same level. Why should you accept him? The only possibility is another human being. And there the big question mark is there. Why should you accept? That is the big problem. That is the question mark we have put before ourselves. Why do we accept another human being? When we ourselves are human. And how does he have anything more that we don't have? This question used to be put to my master. And he used to answer in a beautiful way. He used to say, if you have a number of radio sets, those days radio had just come to India, and we could switch on different stations and hear the news on the stations from different Bombay, Delhi and different places. So he used to say, if you have a number of radio sets, and they don't have the batteries, and their cords are not connected with power, but the rest of the radio sets are all there, they are no good. They look alike. They have all the valves, they have got the transistor, they have got everything in it. They look identical, all of them. But the one which you plug in gets you the news of the world. Therefore, if there is one that is plugged in with the current, that radio set is not the same as the other radio set, even if they look the same. Is there such a thing as one human being who is plugged in somewhere else and is not like the rest? Is there a current which gives him the news of the world, which we can listen to? Well, there is the current of consciousness, of awareness. We know that the levels of awareness constitute a continuous current. Even when we shift our levels of consciousness, whether from the dream state up to the astral state or to the higher state or to the wakeful state, we know the continuity of the self persists and connects it to that one current. So, if this current is flowing through us, the current of consciousness, and has some form, then we should be able to find the answers to our problem from a human being who is linked up to higher level of awareness, whose connection is established and he speaks the news, tells us the news of the world, tells us the news of what's going on there. If he tells us the news, he is different from the rest of the radio station, radio sets. So a human being who has this connection is the one who is different. And he is the one who should be chosen. But then the problem is there are so many fakes. They just put on little records inside and go on giving news. We never know, know whether these are genuine news from above or these are just local news produced by little de devices and gadgets for children. But if they do accept the need to find another human being with another mind, but who has a connection with the higher levels of awareness, if they accept that, and it is not difficult to accept it theoretically, we can say, all right, we do realize that there seems to be no other way except to get hold of a guy who has a connection with a higher level of awareness. We we'll go out and find out such a guy. When you go out to the market to find such a guy, you find there are more such guys than the finders of those guys. There are more products being sold than customers. There are more seekers, there are more gurus than seekers today. The gurus galore everywhere. 
So many gurus. How do you find? How do you know who is the guru? Are there any signs to check? If there were any particular names written down, they would all write them down. It's very difficult to find out. The big problem for a seeker on the path to Brahmacharya or the higher realms of consciousness has been how to find the guru. How to know who is the guru. Now here, there are two approaches to the problem. First is, can the seeker find the guru at all? Is he capable of finding? And the answer given by the yogis is, he is not. So why waste your time in the first place? The guru is the one who's got the connection. He knows. We don't know. How can we find the one who knows? Therefore, we should not find. We should allow ourselves to be found. The prescription given by the yogis is, you cannot find a guru. The guru will find you. And the statement made there is, when the chela is ready, the guru appears. When the disciple is ready, the guru comes automatically. You don't have to find. You have to be ready. So your finding at best is to prepare yourself for the path. If you prepare yourself, that's the best you can do towards finding a guru. The second approach is that if you do find a guru, you will question, is he the perfect master or no? If you do come across people who are obviously of higher awareness, and you have no doubt about it. From their talk, from their company, from the impact they have on you, from the vibes as are known here, you come to know. At least he is more than I am. But there are so many like that. Now how do I decide? First stage was alright. But now there are so many. What do I do about it? I am looking for the perfect master. So I keep on looking. There the answer is that you cannot judge the perfect master. At best you can do at best, what you can do is to get hold of one who is ahead of you. My master used to tell me, people who are still in the primary grade, trying to study in class 2 and 3 and still not gone over, they are disputing. I want a PhD. No, I want a double PhD. See, that's only a master's degree. That pupil hasn't gone into high school. What difference will it make? Apart from the fact that he cannot know. Who is done what grade? What difference will it make to him at that time? At that time, whoever takes him ahead is the guru. And at the appropriate time when he has reached the level of college, he has to switch on to the one who is perfect. And this will be attained through the intervention of the one who is perfect. I remember a very interesting colleague of mine on the spiritual path, an engineer from Burma who was a very keen seeker and he sought for a perfect guru all over the world. He was very stingy, miserly, couldn't spend a, a rupee or a dime. He used to think ten times, should I or should I not spend this dime? That kind of a man. But he was willing to spend on a guru if he could find one. So strong was his seeking and his desire to attain the higher realms of consciousness. At last he heard when he was visiting Rangoon that in India, in Madras, there was a yogi who had reached the higher levels and therefore he will be able to take any disciple to those higher levels. He made the long journey to Madras in India to find that yogi and the yogi said, My son, you have come to the right place. You have come for knowledge. Have you got the price to pay for knowledge? I think they all read about Raja Janak or something. The way they talk about price. Anyway, he said, yes, master, I have come with everything. I have left my home in Burma and I have come here to find true light. And the guru said, how much is your bank balance? He said, well, I have about 25, 30,000 rupees in my bank. He says, first of all, transfer that to me. I need it for my temple. I am building a temple. Now, this man who was so careful about a single dime that he would spend, transferred the entire amount that he had, the entire money. 25,000 rupees to the account of that guru. Then the guru said, Now I have to teach you the art of rising to higher level of consciousness behind the eyes. And for that purpose, you have to concentrate on the breath that you take, the breathing. And you have to concentrate on the breathing. Since you breathe through these two nostrils, your concentration has to be evenly distributed. 
and therefore you have to repeat some holy mantras that I will tell you once while breathing through this and once while breathing through this. Once on the left, once on the right. And you can't change the breathing by using your hands like this because if you do that, all your attention will go into the hands. So you have to do it internally by using your tongue. So you must twist your tongue back to the back of the throat in the palate and with the tip of the tongue operate the valve closing one then the other then this and that. A very tough exercise. And this man said I am ready to do it. So keen was his desire. He said all right you have to make a sacrifice to do it. This giving, handing over the money to me and agreeing to do this exercise is no sacrifice. You have to make a personal bodily sacrifice. And for that you have to get the tendons under your tongue which hold your tongue down chopped off so that the tongue can roll back. And I won't do it in a clean, painless surgery. I'll do it painfully so that you know you made a sacrifice. I'll sandpaper them. It's so painful, but this man's desire was so keen, he accepted. And the master said, I will do it in seven days. So you remember the sacrifice you have made. I'll do it a little bit at a time. For seven days, this man went through the torture of getting sandpaper rubbed. And that, not, that was not ordinary sandpaper. That was is some kind of a nettle leaf. It was terrible. The pain wouldn't go for days with one rubbing. And that's how the master prepared this disciple to go to higher realms of awareness. After seven days, he used to get some treatment, antiseptic treatment. Then he had a month's rest to get back his normal senses. Then he began to practice the art of meditating with the tongue. Later on, many years later, when he told me the story, I said, why didn't you turn around? Now, this is what happens with an intellectual guy like me. I said, why didn't you tell him that if by doing this, the uh, attention will go to the hands, by doing that with the tongue, the attention will go to the tongue. You could have got away with it. Anyway, he, he did all that. And when he practiced that, he saw great light, flood of light inside. He saw visions which are too beautiful. The master said, are you making progress? He said, I am very happy. Things are happening. Much later, he said, what is all this light I am seeing? Where is the truth? Did I come to see little light and color and all that? Or did I come to see, have the truth? So he went to the master and said, I have made good progress under your care and your guidance. But I have only seen these lights. I haven't seen the truth. I want to know why are we here? What are we here for? What's the purpose of life? Why has it come into being in the first place? What's our role? What's it all about? I want to know what's it all about. The lights don't tell me. And that master said, Oh, these are much higher questions. I am not equipped for that. I am not your master for that. I have finished my job by showing you the lights. Another master will now give you further instruction. In due course, that man became the disciple of the same master whose disciple I had the privilege to be. And he made great progress. And he outran all of us who were earlier disciples and having reached satisfaction and happiness. One day he was talking to the master and I overheard him. And it's because of that conversation I brought the whole story up today to you. He said to the master, Master, had I known that you are the perfect one, I wouldn't have given those 25,000 bucks over there. <laughs> I feel I just wasted and put them somewhere else. And the master answered and said, you wasted nothing. The moment you came to me, I transferred all that contribution to myself. <laughs> nothing was lost. The point I am making is, in the spiritual journey, nothing is ever lost. Whatever you are doing, by way of your seeking, your preparation, is all being accounted for finally, in the account of the perfect master who has to find you at the right time. Therefore, on the second approach, one cannot say, well, I am waiting till I find a perfect master. I will wait aside. You get one who is ahead of you and go our, as far as he can go. Be ready. Be ready to accept what he gives you at any point of time. At the right time, he will give you what you need and for which you are ready. Path of Brahmacharya, they say, accept the yogi who is ahead of you, who can take you above these two distractions. And in due course, you will find the one who will take you to Brahm, Trikuti, the creator of all universes. Thank you. Any questions? Glad to answer. Yes. 
about this, about um, allowing someone that's just above you. Is it just possible to find someone who, who's, instead of taking you a little on the way, will take you the wrong way completely? Yeah, it is. Uh, the distinction will be if he takes you within yourself, he's on the right path. If he takes you outside anywhere, he's on the wrong path. Because this is certain that the truth is within us. We have no doubt. Or have you any doubt? If there is no doubt that the truth is within us, and anyone who takes us within ourselves is on the right path. If anyone takes us outside to himself or anywhere else, he's taking us on the wrong path. Simple. Yes. Some of my students have gone to the uh, Guru Maharaji, the once was a 14 year old guru in India. You know of him? Yes. Now he's 21, he's living in California. Well, uh, somebody told me once that you said that uh, his father was a disciple of the great master, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. And he set up on his own as a guru? Yes. My father knew him very well. That's how I know. Yes. Any other question? Yes. You mentioned that the masters had said uh, the householder's life is the is the solution to the problem. But what about those uh, those disciples who aren't yet married or what? The solution has been offered in the prescription that on the spiritual path, it's not the activity that's important; it's the effect it has on the attention. If the attention is held down. It's a, it's a distraction. The intention is not held down. It's not a distraction. Sometimes doing a thing distracts you. Sometimes not doing a thing distracts you. You have to make up your mind on this basic criterion. Is it distracting to your attention to be concentrated behind the eyes or not? And each one will come to find out what is distracting and what is not when you try. <coughs> Theoretically, you can go on discussing endlessly. If you actually practice meditation, you will come to know immediately what is distracting you. It will come before you. It will come up right before you and prevent you from concentrating your attention. So you will know precisely what is distracting you. If seekers uh, adapt the, the master who, or the yogi or whatever who, can teach them something that they don't already know and keep going in that direction, but to find the perfect master eventually, that is already predetermined, right? Yes, it so, is. Some the belief is that, uh, uh, of course, I believe it fully, so I still call it belief for people who would not like to accept my statement at, at face value. The belief is that it is predetermined billions of years ago who will be our perfect master, when he will meet us, when he will initiate us. The rest is a process of going. Then how high can the um, uh, persons who are not my souls hope to go? They go back on the grand dissolution. The yeah. marking takes place in every grand dissolution. And, well, let me put it this way. How high a master can they hope to ultimately uh, rise? They can uh, go up to Trikuti, which is a very high state. Brahmacharya, it's open to everybody. What I talked of today is open to everybody. The highest level. Yes. And those who go back at grand dissolution without the help of the mystic, will they be conscious? No. They'll be dissolved. <laughs> That's no fun, isn't it? When I used to hear Satsangi is telling me, not the master, Satsangi is telling me, we are all waiting like drops of water of an ocean, ready to go back and birds in the ocean. I used to get a little worried, I tell you. I used to get worried that is, this is the purpose of this teaching and practice. <coughs> go back and get merged. What am I getting out of it? Because as a drop of water, I have an entity, I have an experience, I have a universe, I have something. If I go and get merged there, I lose everything I have. Then I lose everything I have. On the other hand, the one in whom I merge gains nothing. He's already in the ocean. Who is the gainer out of it? If uh, the individual soul is like a drop of water and God, the creator, is an ocean and we have to go back and merge in that ocean, and the ocean gains nothing by one drop. He doesn't care whether you merge or you don't merge. He will be the same. And we lose everything by merging. What are we getting? What are we working for? It used to worry me. <laughs> Till I discovered that this was not the situation. 
it is not a situation that we are drops of water away from the ocean who are seeking to go back and merge in it. That is not the truth. The truth is no drop of water ever left the ocean because the ocean continued to be the total, remain the whole. If it didn't remain the whole, it wouldn't be the total ocean. It wouldn't be God. Nothing ever left God. God is whole, has never been broken up. There is no subdivision of God. There cannot be any subdivision of God. He cannot be subdivided. He is total. He is one. If he is always total, then where are we? As drops of water in God. We have never left him. But we have acquired the awareness of individuation. The awareness of drops. It is God's plan to individuate to a drop-like awareness. And merging means regaining, expanding awareness of totality again. There is no going out and coming in. Therefore, if it is merely the same awareness which has become a drop and the same awareness becomes the total, then there is a gain. I'm going there. When I understood this is the purpose, I am again happy. And back on the path. <laughs> Alright, thank you very much.